I'm not going to read all of Norm's uh, bio. He's got a, a, a long pedigree of research uh, in blended learning and online learning and student engagement, etc., etc., etc. He's done really a lot of great things. Um, I want to highlight two things that have had a pretty significant impact on the world of blended learning. One is a book called Blended Learning in Higher Education. This book is the top cited book of any book on blended learning. No, yours is. It, it's not. Yours this is, is it. <laughs> this, is, this is it. No, yours is. Um, <laughs> um, he worked on this with Randy Garrison. Um, who is a, another top researcher from Canada who's done a lot of work in online and blended learning. In fact, Randy was his doctoral, doctoral supervisor. supervisor. So um, that's great. And then more recently, he, he has a follow-up book on that, teaching, blend, teaching in Blended Learning Environments, Creating and Sustaining Communities of Inquiry. Both of these books have a very strong pedagogical approach to blended learning. And that's one of the things that I like uh, so much about Norm is that for him, blended learning is not about the cost savings, it's not about the efficiency, it's about learner engagement and impacting the learner in positive ways. In fact, if you look at his bio, I'm just going to read the first line of it, it says, for Dr. Norman Vaughan, students are the bottom line. And I think that's really the case. So let's... Um, Give a warm welcome to Norm, and then we'll turn the time over to him. First, I just want to check, can you hear me at the back? Just, if I start going down, just give me the thumbs up. I'm teasing, we had a session this morning, and whenever I think of distance education, I think of people in the back row. So, again, just make sure you can hear me. The second thing I want to really emphasize is just what a difference Charles has made um, in the world of blended learning. One of the things I learned early on in my, in my graduate work is never do anything on your own. You know, it takes a village to raise a child and how important collaboration is. So just want to give a shout out to Charles because he's been a real pioneer in this area. I think a lot of you know the uh, research, blended learning research perspectives, volume two has just come out and it's been wonderful because he's really helped to develop that sense of community. Now, the other thing, I was completely blown away by Lisa, Christine, Daniel, is Curtis, Curtis, your set, and all the others, sorry, Christine, yours as well, the sessions this morning. So what I'd like to do, I know not all of us were able to be there this morning, but I want to build on some of their work. So what I've found has been really useful for my students is more and more of my students are bringing these devices, laptops, tablets, whatever. Unfortunately, sometimes the tablets, it doesn't work perfect. So what I'd like us to do is, I know not everybody was here this morning, but this is going to be a bit of a reflective session. So I'm going to talk a little bit about student engagement. For those of you who were at the talk this morning, it's going to be a little simplistic, but let's go with it. But what more importantly I've got, I've set up a little document. It's a Google Doc. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Google Doc, but I'm hoping that if you've got it at your table or somebody's got a laptop, we can contribute it to it. Because one of the things I find really powerful and one of the things I love about teaching is that I'm learning all the time. And I promise, whatever we put together, it's just tinyurl.com slash BYU March 2014. Whew, I got the year right. Usually I put 2013. If we could do that, it'd be wonderful because I think it'll be a valuable set of notes as we go through this because we all bring this shared interest and passion for this topic and I think it'll be a great shared resource after because as you'll see I start talking maybe a little too quickly and I'll, I'll try and keep it slow. So to begin with student engagement and, and Christine, Lisa you've just given me way too much to think of but as I think we know it's a complex term and it's fascinating. Our institution where I come from in Canada just celebrated its 100th anniversary and right from our very first mission statement, we've always had that word student engagement. The one thing, though, is we've not had a very rich discussion about what does student engagement mean? So what I'd love you to do, because a lot of you may not know the other people at the table, could you just take a, a moment and just introduce yourself to the other people at the table? And then 
I'm hoping at least one person at the table has a device, and if they have the device, again, I'll get back to the website, but if they could just put it up and you're ahead of me, the one problem is I find with Google Docs here, I'll make it big, we're going to start typing over each other. But just once you introduce yourself, would you just take a moment just to share your perspective? Because it's going to be fascinating. What you think student engagement involves, I have a feeling could be quite a bit different than your neighbor or the person sitting beside you. So if you would just give me the, the, the honor of allowing you to introduce yourselves to the people at the table, and just if somebody could be the recorder, and I see the problem already, we're sort of erasing my problem. Google Docs isn't perfect. So I'm going to try and be quiet for two minutes. Introduce yourself, and I'll bring up the uh, website address again. <laughs> There's some seats up here. Up here. There, there's lots of seats at the front too if people want to come out. Don't be afraid. It's good at the front. Hey, don't be afraid. There, there's seats up here. perspective, just the conversation. And this is always the most difficult thing because we're not a class, we haven't built a sense of community yet, so I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but this is always a bit of fun, is that there might have been a definition, a comment, you go, wow, that's something I didn't think about at all. You could point at that person and maybe we'll get that person to volunteer their comment, their idea. Anybody willing to point at somebody? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Would you mind sharing your definition? Stand up and say loud. Thank you. Loud too. Okay. You Wait the back. Well, I was just commenting that there are levels of engagement, and kind of first level is we just want them to engage in the activities that are going on, but there's another level we really want them to get to, which is some form of self-investment, some form of embracing uh, the role of learner beyond just what's going on in the classroom, embracing the subject, the community and, and acting on their own motivation. Their own motivation, and I know I saw it, some of it got rubbed up, you know, in terms of <coughs> developing who they are, the character, the moral traits. 
And again, I'm hoping that Lisa, Christine, Daniel, and Curtis will allow me to link, maybe if I could link to your PowerPoint, because we had a really rich discussion here, just like you say, the different levels, the different entry points is way the emotional, the social, the psychological, and the cognitive. Thanks for that. And again, I think we could easily spend the whole session just talking about that. Um, what I thought I would do, again, is there's just so many different perspectives, is just sharing some of the readings that I've done. And I think some of you may be familiar with this individual. Um, he does a lot of work with the Obama administration. He's on your National Education Advisory Council. Dennis Lipke runs a series of for-profit schools. And what I like about Dennis, and you'll see I'm a very simple person, but he talks about the three R's of engagement. How important that the students can see a connection. And Charles and I have studied psychology for a long time, and we think about David Ausubel in the 60s, about anchoring events where students can really see there's an entry point for them. The other thing is that I think we all find that there's the investment. If it is something that we're engaged in, it's going to be rigorous. And we've got a Canadian, I know you've heard of Malcolm Gladwell, from just where I came from. He talks about 10,000 hours, the tipping point, you know, in order to be a good hockey player or a good musician. It takes time. And last, but definitely not least, and you know this because you're such a strong community here, is we don't learn in isolation. We learn in a community, and I've just, Thank you for welcoming me into your community. I just, again, you have to be careful. Once I get my hooks into people, it's sometimes a little too much. So we've got Dennis's perspective, and then it was wonderful. Christine, I, how do we pronounce his last name? Chick sent me Holly. Is that really how you, I, I always trip over it. But um, it was wonderful. Christine and Lisa, Daniel and Curtis were talking about the different dimensions. This is a fellow that's pretty close to us in Canada, and my apologies, my apologies, but we are passive aggressive, and we take the Winter Olympics very seriously, and where I come from, it was 2002 is the Salt Lake Olympics, 1988 is Calgary, and it's still our legacy, it's our training grounds, so we bring him in every four years to get our athletes in the zone, you know, the flow, getting them in the zone, the difference between a gold and a silver medal. So he means a lot to us at my institution. The other thing, I think you've probably heard of this fellow before, Daniel Pink. Uh, somebody told me that he was a speechwriter for Al Gore at one time. I'm not sure about that. But this is an interesting book to read because it gets at this idea of engagement. And a lot of the interviews were with Christy Chick sent me hi and hi. And with Dennis Litke, because Daniel Pink sends all of his children to the bigpicture.org profit school. So he talks about, again, with engagement, the sense of autonomy, the sense of mastery, and again, especially with the mission of BYU, that there's a sense of purpose. That just as you mentioned, it's not just engagement to be busy. There is a deep, and in this case, a spiritual purpose for what they're doing. The other thing, we've got a fellow in Canada, just to give you a few Canadian examples, he was the dean of our largest education program at the University of Toronto for a number of years, and he does a lot of international work. Christine, I was just thinking of your study. Christine's doing some fascinating work about what are people outside of North America, outside of the US and Canada doing? And so he's doing a lot of work with the, the, the Singapore system, the Finnish system, in Canada, I don't know why it is, but we, we love it. We always look to you. Don't, don't get me wrong. We look to the states. But we've been looking more and more to educational systems around the world. So he talks about the three Ps. The idea, again, there's purpose, but there's also that sense of passion. And I saw it come up in the Google Docs that there's some enjoyment here, that we are actually enjoying ourselves. It's hard work, but we're enjoying what we're doing. And last but not least, Christine, I'll make sure you get this website, and it's fascinating. Daniel was talking about mouse tracking, the different ways that we can get senses of engagement. But this is a national study that we did in our country, and it was getting a little bit, Christine, of what you were doing, those trying to get a pulse, the little surveys. A lot of it was just observational. Somebody going in and observing what was taking place in the classroom. So really trying to look at, you know, what does flow look like and sound in a classroom? And as this gentleman, sorry, I forgot your name, Richard. Richard, as Richard mentioned, there are different dimensions to engagement. And they often looked at, um, you know, the social engagement at BYU. I can only imagine what it must be like here on a Saturday for a football game. It just must, the town must go upside down. So the social engagement, unfortunately what happens in our high school program in my country 
is that students have a very strong sense of an academic engagement, but not intellectual. We've got, just like you've got the SATs, we've got very high stake grade 12 diploma exams that really, they, 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 what university, or even if you're gonna go to university, so the students are so fo focused on the requirements. You know, is this gonna be on the test? What do I need to study? Am I doing okay? Whereas you mentioned, we wanna get at that deeper level where students have a spiritual, a psychological, a social, a mental sense of engagement in what they're doing. And this is just a graph they've done, and, and Christine, I'll make sure, because I really want to stay in touch with your work. This is a friend of mine, Sharon Friesen, who did it, but, oh, Christine, it's so sad when we look at what happens with students, especially from grade six to grade 12, on all the factors, their sense of belonging, their sense of participation, their attendance, the intellectual engagement is just a steady slide down. They feel more and more disengaged because they don't see a place for them in the high school system. Okay, now, um, Curtis, I know this is simplistic, but is, is Kristen still here from the provost's office? Okay, she's not, I, just what we do, I'll be honest, is at our institution, it's really important that we can show what we're doing is aligning with the mission and vision of our institution. And we're a relatively new university, and we're really concerned about the quality of the student experience. And so for better or worse, I think it's about 12 years now, you've developed the National Survey of Student Engagement. And this has really taken hold in Canada. And we've got a national magazine, and that's how it ranks the universities, is based on these five dimensions. Students' perceptions of how active and collaborative they are, um, the quality and the nature of interactions they're having with faculty members, how they perceive the academic challenge, the enriching ed educational experience that they're having outside of the classroom, and what we do as an institution to support their learning environment. And it really is amazing, Christine, I was just thinking, I'm sort of tracking what's going on internationally. So now they have new terms. In, the, in North America, we call it the Nessie. Down under, they call it the Aussie. So it's the actual Australian, or it's Austral, Austral Asian, sorry, Survey of Student Engagement. And then they have something now called the SASI. So they're doing this in South Africa. And what I find fascinating, I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing, but Christine, it's really allowing us to learn from others, especially in New Zealand. New Zealand only has eight universities, so they actually pool that data and looking at it from an analytica point of view. When you've got that big pool of data, you can start to see some interesting trends. Okay, so I think again, that's why we like to start with this sense of engagement. We talked this morning about the confusion around the blended learning. So if I could bother you, if you can just scroll down on your, um, excuse me, the Google Doc, hopefully everybody, somebody, somebody at the table has it. And again, I'll share the address with this with Charles. So if you don't have a computer, everybody can get it. But if we scroll down a little bit, I'm just curious, Again, and this is something that I think is so important, and this is what I always do with my students, either face-to-face -face or online, is first as a group, either it's an online discussion or it's face-to-face, -face, we define what blended learning means. Because again, we'll get things in the, uh, the timetable, we'll get things in the course calendar, but I think it's really important as a group and especially if you're doing it at a program level, that people are clear what blended learning means. So again, if I could turn it back to the tables, and it's fascinating because again, we've got some people here from different departments at BYU and from different campuses. So I'm going to zip it again, and just your definition of blended learning. Over to you.
discussion beyond the classroom because often you'd finish a class like that you go oh if only I'd said that or now that I'm thinking I want to reflect and add it so one of the things I commonly see is this integration of face-to-face -face and online learning but I'm starting to see a lot of others starting to come out about sort of really trying to identify what are the learners needs the issues what are the teachers sort of really trying that personalization of learning the big thing I find with blended learning is really having that conversation with students so that they're clear about the roles and responsibilities. That if it's going to be a community, I am the teacher, I'm the teacher of rector, I am the captain of the ship, I will keep my hand on the wheel or on the rudder to make sure we keep going straight. But if this is truly going to work, we're all going to need to participate in this. We're all going to be engaged and engage not just in busy level, but start to take on a leadership role. There's that old quote, I think it was a French philosopher, Joubert, to teach is to learn twice, to provide opportunities for students to share and learn from each other, how important that is. So thanks so much for that, we'll get back to that in a minute. Thank you for being patient with the Google Doc. So as Charles said, I really had the privilege to work with, with um, Randy Garrison, and it, it really is fascinating, we're just, um, oh, we can get so excited but get so confused at the same time. And one of the things that I found, and again, Randy really is a scholar of John Dewey, as is David Kolb. And some of you may be familiar with David Kolb at Case Western. He's the one who's got Kolb's learning cycle. And Randy has something that looks identical. They swear, I, I've had lunch with the two of them, and they swear that they did their work independently. But the idea of really building on the work of that pragmatist John Dewey, this idea that one size doesn't fit all, this isn't prescriptive, is that you really need to figure out what is going to work most effectively. And again, it's the design, but it's the organization. Obviously, it's important we go in with an educational design, but if it's not working, we've got to adjust for the needs of the students. I think you folks are at BYU-Idaho were mentioning, I think on a weekly basis, you're surveying the students just to get their pulse to see what's going on. So if it's not working, you adjust very quickly to meet the needs of the students. So again, it's always a two-way street. Teaching and learning is always about communication. We're giving feedback to the students about their learning, but we need feedback on our practice in order to make sure it's gonna work for everybody. Uh, I think that's, yes, oh, I just wanted to show this, and I wanted to use 
um, enriched rather than traditional. But when we look at different models, and I think a lot of you know that Charleston has done some just some amazing work looking at different blended learning frameworks, I just want to give you a few that I've worked on. So this idea, when we think of it from the Western world, we think of the rich traditions of Germany, of England, the Oxford, sort of the um, Oxford-Cambridge model, where it really was a rich face-to-face -face interaction. It was the tutor and the two T. Then what happens, um, especially in the UK, is so, somewhat in the United States, there was the Open University that started in the late 60s, early 70s in the UK. Our Open University is called Athabasca University. And originally, it was what we call asynchronous, and it was sort of um, correspondence school in a way, is that you'd get something mailed out to you and it would come back. And then I'm going to pull a little Canadian Anna on you. Has anybody ever heard of WebCT, Web Course Tool? Yeah. Sorry, I have to say, guys, that's a Canadian. So I just <laughs> I didn't want to do this. But, but, you know, I think it really was. You know, we had the advent of the, um, well, the internet early on, late 60s, early 70s. We had the web really start to take off in the early 90s. And it was Murray Goldberg at our University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver who really developed one of the first web-based course tools and for me, that really was the idea that we could do something in the classroom, but students could access supplemental resources outside of that. Again, I know here in Utah, you have a rich history of, of distance learning. And you know, we've used the telephone for a long time. But when we think sort of at the around 2000, 2002, the advent of web-based conferencing, you know, Skype is just prolific. Again, there used to be something, has anybody ever heard of Illuminate? Yeah. Yay, that was developed at our university, University of Calgary. Blackboard bought it really quickly. But just this idea of synchronous conferencing, and I think some people are mentioning BYU, Idaho, I'm looking for, she's somewhere. But was, yeah, there you are, sorry. But you're just talking about how it's a rich experience for students. It's not just asynchronous. You've built in a lot of synchronous communication opportunities. And again, one size doesn't fit all, depending on the discipline, depending on the context, that can be really rich. What's been really wonderful for me is over the past couple years, I've been working with our, our indigenous, our First Nations group, and it's really fascinating. We have a, a sort of a fellow who's called the Grand Chief of all our different indigenous people, and his name's Sean Atlio. He's this fella down here in the bottom left-hand corner, and Sean's kind of a fascinating fella because he actually has his master's in instructional design, and he actually did it in a blended way from Curtin University in Australia. So he really gets it firsthand. And what he's tried to do, similar to I know rural communities in Utah, but our reserves are all over the place. So what we've tried to do is marry the, bo the both worlds. There's a lot of synchronous instruction that takes place through Illuminate or through WebEx or, or, or um, Skype. But what we found is really important is we need to have a local context. So what we've done is we've trained either local elders people on the ground who really understand the local context and are able to provide that nurturing support that our students need. Again, for various reasons, a lot of our students on reserves um, are at risk, things like that, and this has been just a win-win for them. We've got an 80% completion rate over the past 10 years, and I'll make sure there's papers at the end of it, but it's just been a huge success story for us in Canada. And I think what's made it so successful, it really has been the collaboration between the technology, some of the ideas I have, but some of the local needs, how it's been suited. So we've got, working with our petroleum companies, we've got safe places to come on the reserves to, to learn. We've got really high-speed internet access through satellites. So there's a safe place for people to learn. And just like um, you were mentioning at BYU Idaho, we have weekly tasks, so it's just trying to set goals on a weekly basis. Here's what we're going to do on a Monday. They sit down with their face-to-face -face mentor. Here's the goals we're trying to meet. Then on Friday, the online tutor goes through, assesses what's going on. Then on the next Monday, we reassess where we are and set our goals. Because again, we were talking this morning, and I, is it okay if I use the BYU numbers? So these weren't complete distance. These were independent online courses, but from the provost office, we heard is it okay if I say this? I think so. Okay, but we were hearing here at BYU Idaho that we're, you know, and we could look at it as a positive. You know, glass is half full, but it's about a 30% completion rate, whereas Kristen was saying, I think it's 96 to 97% completion for your face-to-face -face courses. And Charles and I are the same way. We'll make it 100. 
it'll happen. But again, we need to work within partnership, and I think this was what we heard consistently, Christine, Lisa, Daniel, Curtis, um, Christine, is we need to really work with the learners. Where the learners are, where are they, how can we support them so that we make it 100%. Okay, go for it, question. I think that one of the, 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 the holy grails of instructional design has always been to lower the requirement or the cost of teaching, okay, of instruction. And the thing is that we can see from experience that you cannot have a non-existent instructor. You need to have a teacher, you know, you have to have a mentor, okay? You and I agree with that, and again, just, let's go off topic. You know, this is really fascinating. <laughs> it is just, we can skip some of the other stuff. But what's fascinating for me, again, it's not perfect, but to see what's happening with this massive open online courses, and some of them, I'll be honest, I'm a little skeptical about some of those West Coast ones with Coursera, but a couple weeks ago, I had a chance to work with Harvard and MIT on their edX program, and I think that's much more altruistic, and I'm trying to think, remember, Robert, there's an online course, he's sort of one of the godfathers of um, andragogy, adult education, Bob Reddy, I forget his name, but he's running a course, and it's fascinating, because what he tried to do very quickly through surveys was identify who could be the online mentors within the course for different reasons. Because I think it is, whether that's the way we are, we're humans, it's communication. Somebody mentioned you're, somebody's doing a degree in human development or something. I think that's so close to what we do. But it is, the human element, you know? Um, our nursing faculty has a phrase, the more technology around us, the more the need for the human touch. And again, the human touch comes in different ways, because I'm so, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Deborah. Deborah, I will never forget your name, but Deborah has some rich, Deborah, some rich stories about how students actually feel more connected in an online course than they do in a face-to-face -face course. And again, it's contextual, but there's people who share similar stories. It allows them to get access at different points. So I think we cannot underestimate the human element. So just on a positive note, because I don't want to run out of time here, we'll get rid of those is I think a lot of you are familiar with this study, and I, I, I've made sure I put it in here. It was a couple years ago. It was a woman, Barbara Means, from the Stanford Research Institute, and I actually got to hear her speak a year ago, and the big thing she emphasized to me, it wasn't so much the modality, whether it was face-to-face, -face, online, or blended. It was the design, the, and I'm gonna uh, shout out to the Teaching and Learning Center here. It was that it was redesigned in partnership, again, there's just too much going on. Obviously, as faculty members, we have some pedagogical experience, we've got the subject matter expert, but we need to work with the librarians. It's key, we've gotta work with the librarians, we've gotta work with student learning services, the ID department, we've gotta work together. So her finding was, it wasn't again so much the modality, is that it was back to, like you said, instructional design. There was an intentional design. Christine, you had that this morning in your presentation, John Biggs. He's the father of constructive alignment, so we see that there's a clear alignment between the outcomes, the assessment, the activities, and the way that we're using tools. Okay, uh, on the downside, just I wanna share, and again, you can type in yours. The biggest issue we found with students at my institution, this is primarily an undergraduate institution, there's always gonna be technology issues. The biggest issue was for them making the transition from high school to university or to college. And I don't think this is anything new, but just the way our testing system set up is I think this has become more acute. Um, I talked a little bit about helicopter parents, bubble wrapping. Our parents have become a big challenge as well because they're not clear. Our parents are paying a lot of money for tuition these days and they're wondering, I'm paying all this tuition for my child, why is my child only sitting in class one day a week? What's all this blended learning stuff? So the big thing we found was transitioning students from being passive, just taking information in and then regurgitating it onto tests, to actually becoming engaged and, and really being curious and solve problems. On the faculty point of view, I'm not quite sure how BYU set up, and I should have asked you, but one of our dirty secrets, Charles, is that faculty are worse than students. Again, um, Christine, in your literature, you talked about student uh, surface and deep approaches to learning. It all comes down to assessment. If students are gonna be assessed with multiple choice quizzes and things like that, they'll take a very superficial approach. If they're gonna work with deep and meaningful, rich community projects, they'll take a deeper approach. 
the way faculty are assessed at my institution, it's not even publish or perish anymore. It's how much grant money we're bringing in to fund our, our graduate students. So it makes sense. That's what our faculty do. We have limited amounts of time in our day. We put all our money into getting grants, and we just let our teaching go at the side. Or the first thing we do is get grant money so we can get bought out of our teaching. So again, I think that's really important in a teaching and learning center is managing the risks, understanding where faculty come from. In terms of administration, we talked a little bit about this um, this morning. It's really too bad Christine's not still here, because it's great to get the provost's office's view here from BYU. But this is where things, I think, can go really south, and it's too bad. Wendy, are you here? If, if Wendy, you're gonna, it's, Wendy's going to do an amazing session in 185 at 2 around faculty development. But she's just done an incredible study looking at the different frameworks of why blended learning can work at an institutional or why it can't. And I think this is where it can falter, where there isn't a meeting of the minds, where faculty and students think it's either a top-down approach and they just go, is this the flavor of the month? Or it comes from faculty, they're excited, but there isn't the support to have it happen. So it really needs to be collaborative between the two groups. Okay, we got time for one more. I know there's a lot of students here in the audience, thanks, but you're all going to be, maybe you're already K-12 teachers, but I just want to take a moment and talk about us, because if this is going to work, it's going to need to be a two-way street. Obviously, we're going to need to focus on improving the environment for students, but what's in it for us as faculty members? We want to create a learning environment where it's rich and everybody has an opportunity to learn. So what I'd like you to do, and now you've got to scroll way down, way down, is I'm curious because it's, it's a complex role being a teacher these days. So if you scroll way down, I wish we had page numbers here. It looks like somebody, some of you made it. But just take a moment at your table, and again, maybe what is new is old. These have always been important roles as teachers. But what, what are some of the roles in order to create a rich, engaging environment where we're combining opportunities for students to learn in the class and outside of the class, what are some of the roles of teachers? So I'm going to be quiet again. I'm going to try. Over to you. I want to be able 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 to be
And Dr. Rich. Is Dr. Williams here? Dr. Williams, Dr. Rich, yeah, you have the tag team here. So again, we, we can see the roles are complex. Can I, it's Richard, right? I think. Yes. Can I pick on you one last time? Just because I can hear Richard's comments here. Richard made such a key point because I think there's a direct connection. Richard, what? you just have to yell it back there, thanks. I just said that teachers have to be equally engaged if we want students to be engaged, but they have to be engaged in a different way. Not in their own expression, but engaged in learning. And I think that's so important because they are looking at, you know, if they're in education or whatever, modeling. And Richard, this is where I think we need to go back to sort of basics, is that too often, and again, it's the way we assess teacher performance, we have service, we have research and teaching, but we need to bring that back together and demonstrate to the students. Because, Charles, just seeing this morning how you've got the students involved in all kinds of, not just research, but service activities with you, I think that's important. My apologies, I promise I'll try not to go to PowerPoint overload, but we will have these notes, and I really encourage people to add your own resources to these notes. It really would be a great shared resource for us. What happened is during the 1990s, with the advent of this idea of computer conferencing, discussion forums, there was a lot of work. There was in the States, there was Zane Burge and, and Bob Mason. Some of you, if you're older, you may have recognized those names. I use that in my master's work. Now, there was a fellow, Morton Paulson, over in Scandinavia, and then there was our gang in Canada. And it's interesting, there's different roles, but it seemed to fall into three categories, that there was sort of that organizational role, there was the social role, and then there was sort of that, that pedagogic and technical, uh, intellectual role. This last one, this is something I think we have to be careful of, because <coughs> we are, we are the subject management experts, we have that, but we all have wonderful resources here at BYU, Provo, and, and Idaho, we have to work in partnership, and I have to stop myself on this, is that Obviously, the students will probably go first to me for the technical support, but I, I, I don't know everything, and we've got wonderful supports for students to do that, so I think we need to make sure we delegate those responsibilities. We need to take a team approach. So, as, as Charles mentioned, there was these three folks, they, they spent a lot of time having coffee together, where Charles's daughter is doing her mission right now in Edmonton. Beautiful place, just wouldn't recommend going in the winter. It's the University of Alberta. And they got, it just like you have the, um, the National Research Council grants here in the States, they got one in Canada to take a look at, you know, what's going on with online learning. And they came up with this idea of teaching, not teachers. So the idea is teaching, it's shared responsibility. And what are some of the things we should look at in terms of not just the upfront design, but the organization as we go through a course, and there's often that idea about being, you know, a sage on the stage and a guide on the side, and the idea, it isn't one without the other. There's times where we need to get in there, especially when we're talking about discussion forums. If it's going south, if people are putting misinformation, one of the most difficult things I find for students is to unlearn what they've, 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 they've held to be a fact for them all the way through, and we've got to be more than a guide We've got to be the leader. We've got to show the leadership. So just what we've done, and again, Charles, can I just put it up? Because I really give credit. The most important thing is 
Okay, this is gonna, sorry, sounds really sexist. Randy and I, when we get together, we have tunnel vision. I don't think we can come up with any new ideas. So we invited an amazing person. Her name's Marty Cleveland Innes. She's the dean or the director of all the distance programs at Athabasca, or Open University. And she convinced us, Charles, to publish this with AU Press. So this book is actually free online in an e-version. You just go teaching presence plus AU Press and you can get it all. And what we tried to do as a group, and again, I'll be honest, we tried not to be prescriptive, but a lot of people said, nice theoretical framework, guys, but could you give us a little more direction in terms of frameworks? How do we actually operationalize this? And so please do not confuse this with Art Chickering and Zeldin Gamson's work. They have the Penelope Seven Principles of Good Teaching Practice, but we came up with a couple key design principles, a couple facilitation, and sort of three direct instruction. And again, it's just Teaching Presence AU Press. I make sure that I'll put the direct link to the free PDF version. And again, take it for what it's worth. But I think it's really fascinating, Charles, just to move into the open publishing area. And what we did, we even broke it down to chapters. So you can just look at one chapter. And speaking with folks in teaching and learning centers, it makes something really rich just to look at one particular chapter. Okay, um, just a couple of things I want to do before we run out of time is that again, this isn't new. I've had the privilege, our provost is New Zealand, from New Zealand, so I've had the privilege of working with him. They only have eight universities, so they actually created their own national teaching and learning center that serves eight universities. I think there's five on the North Island, three in the South Island. And in the Maori language, it's called ako, and it's beautiful. They don't have a separate word for teaching, a separate word for learning, is that we learn through our teaching we learn, and through our learning we teach others. And I just think it's beautiful, and that's the name of their National Teaching and Learning Center. They had a wonderful fellow, you've probably, he's the one who sort of coined the term visible knowledge, visible learning, John Hattie. Christine, they couldn't afford him in New Zealand anymore. He's now in Melbourne, Australia. He runs this really large center. He was in the States, in Washington State, but he's done a lot of meta-analysis looking at about assessment and feedback, and I love his quotes. When we see learning through the eyes of our students, and you mentioned how important faculty development, and again, a shout out to Wendy at two, but faculty development, we need to be immersed in what it's like as a student in a blended and an online environment, and how important it is to develop that autonomy when students start to see themselves as their own teachers. So this is one last quote, and then I'm gonna do a quick case study. This is from um, Herbert Simon, used to be the president of Carnegie Mellon University. And this is what I love what Charles is doing. Just, I don't know if you have any more room, Charles, but anybody, what a research team this morning. Because if we are going to make a difference, we've got to do it by, commu by community. That it's going to be a community-based research activity. It's not me or someone being the Lone Ranger. Because online teaching is not much different. You can go into a face-to-face -face classroom and close the door. I can even use Canvas, don't you? I can go into my Canvas site and not let anybody use it. So here's a very simplistic study of the last five minutes, what we tried to do at Mount Royal. And I just want to show you, it's a very simple study, but again, it was a community-based study. And that's what's important to me. So what we did is the Nessie really looks at the overall experience, but there's a wonderful fellow, Bob Smallwood, Crimson Tide, the football guys. He's the director of the Office of Institutional Analysis at um, Auburn, University of Alabama, how could I forget that? His wife, Judy Wymetz, the one who actually does the Nessie questionnaires, he's developed a classroom survey of student engagement. And again, Christine, Lisa, it's very simplistic, but it starts to look at some of the behaviors, and at least it helps us have conversations with our faculty members about what they understand. So we're just looking at those three factors, and this study was conducted with three people. So it was conducted with my dean, so we had the administrative perspective, with me as a faculty member, and with a student of mine who I lost to nursing. She's doing her master's in nursing education, but I think that's wonderful. And what we did is we got some funding to look at the seven courses, one course in each one of our faculties, which was a real issue for our students in terms of success rates. So those were the seven courses. What we did is we found the classy, and that's why, Christine, I really want to work with you on the pulse because we found that it was limited. It was just looking at the behaviors. So we got permission to borrow some questions from the EDUCAUSE. They run that annual survey about how students are using technology on campuses across North America. Put those together. Um, Fiona's highly trained as a, a facilitator, and I, I'm gonna be careful, because I still feel like I'm 19, 
but students look at me and tell me something, whereas they'll tell other students something differently. So just how important, if we want to get at the student experience, we need students to help get at that. Um, we looked at some very basic analytical information. We're using Blackboard, and then I summed it up with some instructor interviews in a focus group about how we could move forward with what we learned. So this is really simplistic <laughs> stuff. And, and again, it's correlational, it's not causal, because who knows, these might have been the motivated students anyway, but we found those students who perceived that they were more active and collaborative were also the ones that got the highest final <coughs> grades. And Christine, I'm looking at you because this is not great data, but our administration loves this. Because we were talking about it early on. They love data, and this they will continue to fund this sort of work. What we're doing now is a longitudinal study over a program to see how students' perceptions change over four years. The other thing we did is just like you use Canvas here, it's mandatory. All our faculty use a Blackboard site, so it's very simplistic. It's nothing. Daniel, I, I just, that mouse tracking, you hit the nail on the head because it's just too sophisticated with the eyes. Just a shout out to Daniel, who, is Daniel part of your research group or another group? But Daniel's doing some amazing information, or not information, just research about how students move mouses. And I think that really shows their emotional tendencies, the certainty. Ours was just simple, just, you know, frequency of going to their Blackboard site. And again, it wasn't a perfect correlation, but just showing that those students who are more active were the ones who got the highest grades. We were able to drive down a little deeper, though, to see the intensity. And again, these were questions, just not that you're using technology, but how are you using the technology to complete your assignments, to, to, to understand what's going on in the course? And we found that it, the intensity of course-related use, and this is where I've got to work with you, Christine. We've got to refine our questions, and we need to do it as a community. So just, again, it's not all about satisfaction. There was a really famous guy, Robert Perry, in the 1970s at Harvard, Perry's scheme of development, that often students are very unsatisfied with first year courses, but they'll come back in fourth year and say, that was the course that really changed the way I think. So this is dangerous data to look at, but again, our administration loves it, especially if we're trying to get more students and get more funding for blended courses. Um, this is what came out of, um, the focus groups that Fiona did with the other students. And I was really impressed that students actually, again, I think it was Curtis, you were mentioning that technology can actually be a complete other layer of confusion for the students. But if we're using some consistency throughout the entire program, sorry, it was, yes, over, it was this, sorry, it was David. David, I'm sorry, David, give credit where it's due. But this is something that I was surprised at because I always listen to those one or two voices. We hate it, we hate it, we hate projects. But I think students are seeing that more and more we need to work as a community and that these tools are allowing them not just to work in class but to work virtually. And again, just back to your point, the bottom line is the instructor. How important it is not that just we have the knowledge of the content and not that we're lowering expectations, but that we have a sense of empathy, understanding. I saw a question back there. You talked about collaboration as a core value. Have you developed an instrument to measure uh, collaborate your, your outcomes collaboratively? You know, we've got to do that because that's always where I say we get the push because just the way a lot of our assessment is, is developed... It's still individual. Exactly. And I hate to say, you know, even with our group work, there's... Um, I think you work with Larry Mickelson. There's a fellow in the States that's called Team-Based Learning. I thought you had... Or that's DeFink. Sorry, I get... I mean, you're always involved in everything, but, 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 yeah, for the team base, but you know, that's the thing I find, is at the end of the day, we still separate it. We haven't come up. I'll look into that, though, because just, I got tangled up with them just a tiny, tiny bit, but I think business schools, and, and maybe the business school, you mentioned you've got a the LDS school in Salt Lake. There's an LDS business college, but there's also a really strong business school here. But I think the business folks are, are at, just from my perspective, Charles, are at, at the leading edge of this because they're really trying to promote that collaboration. So sorry I don't have an answer for that. Just, I know people are going to have to go. I'll be honest, this was really exciting for me because the least effective aspects were where were great conversation entry points for us with the students. So whether we like it or not, learning takes effort. It takes directed effort, just that you're not randomly engaged, you're not randomly memorizing things. But this was a great conversation we could have with students. That yes, it's going to be hard work. Yes, the semester system or the quarter system is different than what you're used to in high school. And yes, 
you still have to read. It's not just scanning, it's reading. And the importance of reading, and I think we've got somebody here from the English department, like really in reading for purpose. And out of class time, this is something that we need to work on as faculty. I hate it, one last thing. It's a fine line between being in a groove and a rut. A lot of us faculty members have taught these courses for a number of years, so we assume that everybody should know what we were talking about. And how important it is when we're designing, redesigning courses for online or blended learning that we involve previous students in piloting because they can tell us, no, no, that's not going to make sense. And last but not least, the focus on inquiry-based learning and explaining to students why this is important, why this is an important life learning, life, a habit of mind to have. And I think with that, I ran out of time, but, but I'll be able to stick around. I, I know that people are going to, look, I did it right at once. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, we'd invite people to ask questions of Norm down in the soup kitchen. As you know, everyone's invited who would like to come down in room 150. We just have soup, informal discussion. Uh, and you can ask Norm. And, and again, just again, I know we all have different schedules. People are going to have to leave or whatever. But I'll make sure you get that address. I'll put it back. But I really encourage you, even tonight, if there's another thought, please put it down in this document. Because the only way we're going to make a difference is if we work in partnership with everybody. Thanks for the story.